Okay, hello. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I hope it's clear how I changed the due dates for the metaphysics exercises because I forgot to post one at the beginning of the week. So I changed number eight to be due tonight and then number nine will be due on Tuesday and number 10 will be due on Thursday. Number 10 is the last one. Um, are there any questions about anything like that? Okay, so... Um, I'm going to start talking about this reading, which is about skepticism. Um, so skepticism uh, in general is the view that we ought to or um, must suspend judgment that is not believe something, <laughs> right? So, um, uh, um, it's a view that everything should be or is called into doubt. Um, and um, I mean, it's it's an ancient view. It was an ancient. It was a school of ancient philosophy. The skeptics um, who held that uh, you should do this with all your beliefs. So you should call them all into doubt uh, and suspend judgment about them. And uh, Basically, they thought that if you could do that, um, you would be happier because you wouldn't believe things anymore. Um, now, uh, Hume is not, he's not completely against that, but he's not completely in favor of it either. He's a, he likes to describe himself as a moderate skeptic. Um, We'll see more what that involves, I guess, as we go on. But, um, but in any case, whatever his final position is, it does involve making these skeptical arguments. So arguments that um, tend to undermine our belief um, in various respects. Um, and um, in this part of the treatise, Hume is, uh, introduces his skeptical arguments under two headings, that's section one and section two, um, namely skepticism with regard to reason and skepticism with regard to the senses. And by reason, he basically means, at this point, everything that Locke calls reason. So it includes both um, demonstrative argument. That's what uh, Hume, when he's in a stricter mood, calls only this reason. The use of reason to demonstrate things that we can know, as Locke would put it, that is, we can be certain are true because of the demonstration. But uh, in this first part, skepticism with regard to reason, um, Hume also includes, remember, Locke said that reason has something to do both in knowledge and in judgment or the forming of probable beliefs. Um, 
So that is in both cases, reason tells us the proper order of ideas to get to the right conclusion. In this case, we get to a conclusion we're certain of, and in this case, we get to a conclusion that we're inclined to believe as probable. Um, so in section one, Hume is going to give reasons for doubting, for calling into question our beliefs based both on demonstration and on probable reasoning. Um, and then in section two, he's going to give reasons for doubting the things that, um, and this is basically what Locke calls sensitive knowledge. That is, um, it, in, it includes what Hume, uh, what I called remote matters of fact, right? That is the kind of beliefs that, uh, that Hume tried to show where um, we don't have good reason for in the first inquiry. Um, but uh, it includes more than remote matters of fact. It, it, it doesn't stop there. It's directed especially against the, again, what Locke calls sensitive knowledge. That is what we immediately now sense or remember. And um, actually, it turns out as the argument goes on that those aren't that different from each other, that basically what Locke thinks of as um, sensing what's actually present now really involves a kind of belief in remote matters of fact as well. So I will see how that works out. Um, now, I mean, so this is the terminology Locke, I mean, Hume uses here, and it's basically Locke's terminology. We know that in real life, Hume thinks this is not a function of reason, strictly speaking, but of the imagination. Um, the imagination is what establishes orders of ideas that are that are not due to reason, essentially. And according to Hume, the only role that reason has, strictly speaking, in demonstrating things is to explain the relations of ideas. And the relations of ideas are um, the things you can know because of the relations of ideas are only things whose opposite implies a contradiction. So this is pretty limited, according to Hume, and although it's supposed to include mathematics, whereas at least in the inquiry, it's supposed to include, include mathematics. It's actually, that's not so clear in the treatise. But in any case, this part includes um, most of what we usually describe ourselves as knowing, and um, everything we, we infer using uh, rules about cause and effect. And Hume says that there's, you know, in all those cases, we don't perceive any necessity, which would have to come from relation of ideas. All we do is we have a tendency to believe certain things, but we can't say why we should or why they mu those things must be true. Um, Okay, so calling all of this, and sorry, and I should say, and also here, although Locke says that these are things we know via the senses, Hume is going to try to show that also it's not the senses, strictly speaking, that operate here, but the imagination. So it's, you know, it's really the imagination that's involved in both of these, and reason, strictly speaking, is what's involved in that. Um, okay, so if, if we call all of this into doubt, suspend, suspend judgment over all of this, then that would be basically everything that we, um, we used to think we know or believe. Um, at least it certainly includes everything that Locke would say that we know or believe. So, um, 
So calling all of this into doubt at the same time at first might seem impossible. And this is a general, general issue about skepticism that um, um, Hume actually brings this up. So this is book one, part four, section one, paragraph 12 on page 125. So this is an objection to skepticism that he's quoting. He doesn't think it's a good objection. But this is the objection. Um, sorry. If the skeptical reasonings be strong, say they, tis a proof that reason may have some force and authority. Right? So the objection is this. You know, uh, you're going to use reason, make arguments, and the conclusion of the arguments is supposed to be that we should, we should doubt everything, including whatever is due to reason. But how can you do that? Don't you have to rely on reason being reliable? Well, <laughs> doesn't reason have to be reliable if you can use its arguments to make this kind of point? And if it is reliable, then you haven't actually managed to call everything into doubt because you still believe in that. So, um, so basically, it would be impossible to make this kind of argument if the only way of calling something into doubt were to bring some external authority, measure it against that external authority, and see that it doesn't match up. Right, because that external authority would always have to be an exception from the general doubt that you're carrying on. And so the way skepticism, at least this kind of radical overall skepticism, always has to work is not like that, but rather to take the things we believe or think we know and use them against each other. So, right, that is, if, you, if we can show that this couldn't possibly all be right because it's not consistent with itself, you can use part of it to undermine, you can, you can use one part of it to undermine the other part and vice versa, then uh, you can't be certain about any of it and you should suspend judgment. Um, and that's basically, that's the technique that the ancient skeptics used. That's the technique that Descartes uses in the first meditation. First, um, for Descartes, the end point isn't doubting everything, right? For Descartes, the end point is, or anyway, doubting everything is followed by finding something that you can't doubt, that you can be certain of at the beginning of the second meditation. But in the first meditation, Descartes also uses this technique of um, using our old beliefs against each other to undermine each other. And that's also, roughly speaking, the technique that Hume is going to use. And that's his reply to that objection that people make. He says, well, sure, you rely on reason to make this argument. And so, um, in the end, both the reason you're criticizing and the reason you're using to criticize it will be undermined. It will happen at the same time, as he puts it, right? So as one gets weaker, as one gets weaker, the other gets weaker too, until they both disappear. That's, I mean... I'm trying to think whether that's really just the same as what I was saying 
use the different old beliefs against each other. I think it's it's the same thing, but it's just more of a description of the step-by-step -step nature of it, um, which, again, you also see in the first meditation and in the arguments of the ancient skeptics, um, that you start by relying on almost everything that you used to believe and almost every kind of argument you used to make. Um, but then gradually you use the different pieces of it against each other until you're um, supposedly left with nothing. Um, so in particular, so now I'm going to start talking about section one and skepticism with regard to reason. Um, in this part, Hume is going to use reason against itself. Um, however, this is a little bit tricky because he, t he actually does take advantage in this section of the fact that we're using reason in this broad way where it includes both demonstrative reason and probabilistic reasoning. Um, because this is the way the argument starts. So, um... Um, and again, it's step by step. So it, it first destroys one thing, but leaves a lot of other stuff over and then like gradually tries to whittle it down to nothing. So the thing that he first wants to destroy is the idea that we, there's some beliefs we can be absolutely certain of because they're the result of demonstration. So let's say we have this proposition here. I guess it actually uses the term judgment. The two plus two equals four. Um, so this is something that um, Locke thinks we can be absolutely certain of because it has its demonstrative or perhaps intuitive knowledge. But in any case, and Hume agrees that uh, this is a matter of relation of ideas, not matter of fact. Um, so uh, Hume actually thinks whether this is right or not, it's hard to say, but Hume actually thinks the opposite of this involves a contradiction somehow, right? So that if I say two plus two is not equal four, I'm somehow contradicting myself. Um, so, um, so leaving aside the details here, let's assume we have this judgment that we seemingly can be absolutely certain of because we have a demonstration. So Hume says, well, um, but there's a second reflective judgment I have to make. And it's a reflective judgment because it's no longer directly about the subject matter, two and four. It's about me. And in particular, it's about my faculty or power of reasoning. And the second judgment is that... Um, I carried out one correctly, right? That is that I did the demonstration if it requires a demonstration or, um, or you know, observed the intuition if it's intuitive um, correctly that I didn't screw up somehow.
And Hume says, this second reflective judgment, even though this one is demonstrative, this second reflective judgment is always a judgment of probability. It's a judgment of, based, of, um, based on reasoning about cause and effect. Right? So this is how he explains what it is. This is um, Book 1, Part 4, Section 1, Paragraph 1 on page 121. Um, oops. Our reason must be considered as a kind of cause of which truth is the natural effect, but such a one as by the eruption of other causes and by the inconstancy of our mental powers may frequently be prevented. Right, so again, whereas this one is about relation of ideas, it says, you know, look at the idea of two and the idea of four, and you'll see they're necessarily related to each other this way. This one is a judgment about a certain power and um, whether it's consistently always produces the same effect. So according to Hume, that the second one couldn't be demonstrative, right? It's, um, it's not, it doesn't imply a contradiction for me. It, it may imply a contradiction for two plus two equal five, two equal five, but it doesn't imply a contradiction for me to think that two plus two equals five. I could get it wrong. So now if I carried out this one and I say, okay, two plus two equals four, and then I ask, but, but did I get it wrong just now when I thought that 2 plus 2 equals 4? Well, there's no contradiction in me thinking that I did that problem wrong. So um, it's a, a judgment of probability, not of relation of ideas. That is not of necessity. So, you know, so in this case, the second judgment is going to be probably yes, right? That is, I'm going to believe that I did it correctly with some high degree of probability. Um, why? So, again, like, why do we believe this kind of probable judgment about cause and effect, according to Hume? Due to experience. In this case, it's a judgment about me, so it's about it's due to my experience of my previous attempts to do arithmetic problems. Um, I, you know, experienced that usually when I did the problem, I got it right. So I gather that there's a power in me, but what that really means, again, according to Hume, is. I have a custom of making a transition from me doing an arithmetic problem to from the idea of me doing an arithmetic problem to the idea that I did it right. I'm in the habit of making that transition because they usually come together. So um, uh, if they always came together, that habit would be very, very strong, as strong as it could be. But I know that I do sometimes get things wrong. Maybe I've never got this particular one wrong. It's pretty simple, but I know that I've gotten arithmetic problems wrong in the past, even pretty simple ones. Um, of course, usually there was some explanation. I was nervous, I was tired, uh, whatever. Um, but uh, that is, um, it's not to say that, um, I start to think there's no rule at all to what happens. But as he says, I start to realize that my reason is, has to be treated as a cause that usually has this effect, but sometimes for whatever, because of whatever intervening other causes fails to have it. 
um, which again in real life just means my custom is not as strong as it could be because it's based on a conjunction that has usually happened but not absolutely always. So, like I said, he's using reason against itself, but it's a little bit tricky because the two, he's using one sense of reason, that is reasoning, quote unquote, about cause and effect, against the other part of reason, which is reason, strictly speaking, the reason about relations of ideas that, um, by which we know things to be necessarily true or false. Um, so it's a little bit misleading when he says, um, this is, um, book one, part four, section one, paragraph. Nine on page 123. Um. Oops. Mm. Oh, it's in here. These new probabilities, which by their rep repetition perpetually diminish the original evidence, are founded on the very same principles, whether of thought or sensation, as the primary judgment. Right? I'm saying that's a little bit misleading. I mean, that's, that's the idea he's going to use to answer that objection, to say, I just used reason against itself. It's, he says, it's, you know, the secondary judgment, and then, as we'll see, there's a whole bunch of further judgments. You can kind of start to see how they might come about. But anyway, um, this, he's saying the secondary judgment and all the later ones are based on the exact same principles as the primary judgment. Well, you know, that's not exactly true. This one is based on relation of ideas, whereas all the other ones are based on cause and effect or probability, custom, habit. Um, so, um, um, so, you know, you could, it's not really completely clear that at the very moment when you demonstratively or intuitively perceive or understand that two plus two equals four, that you could also, uh, you know, cast doubt on it by appealing to these principles of the imagination. That you remember you've done things wrong in the past, etc. Um, you might think something like, um, at that moment when you really perceive that two plus two equals four, you know that this isn't one of the times when you got it wrong. Um, but Hume at least offers evidence that. Um, Doubting the result of a calculation like this that we carry out, or a demonstration, um, right then and there, is part of what we call being reasonable. Um, so that, you know, we wouldn't think the person who says that to themselves is reasonable, who says, well, 
maybe I got it wrong sometimes, but I know now I couldn't be getting it wrong. Um, and the evidence for that is pretty um, is pretty clear. He, you know, he points out that um, a mathematician, when they do a demonstration, no matter how careful they've been to do the demonstration and get the, uh, you know, prove a certain conclusion, they're not sure until they go back and check their proof. So the demonstration should either, you know, either it works and you're certain of the conclusion, this is what you would think, or you're not certain of the conclusion, then it's not a demonstration. Hume actually said something like that himself in part two, which is interesting. But um, here he points out that this isn't what we do with demonstrations. We run through a demonstration. It's supposed to show that a certain conclusion is necessarily true. But if it's even slightly complicated, we're like, okay, now let me go back and check to make sure I did it right. And then, you know, if it's important to know whether I did it right, I won't stop there. I'll show it to someone else, you know. And he says the mathematician isn't really sure that they have a new good result until it's published and everyone uh, accepts it. And now they're like, okay, I guess I didn't make a mistake there. So, um, right, that's all to show that we, we think it's, if they weren't like that, if they said, you know, okay, I've demonstrated this conclusion, um, so it's definitely true, next, we would think they were being unreasonably self-confident. Um, so we don't think it's reasonable to stop here what we call being reasonable in ordinary life includes making this secondary judgment. Um, and I think perhaps even a stronger piece of evidence he gives from, um, you know, what we do when we need to calculate sums of money and it's important to get the right answer. We, um, so, you know, of course they didn't have computers or whatever then, although, that is, they didn't have electronic computers. They had people who computed things. <laughs> um, but um, uh, even with computers, if it's important enough, we, we make sure to have a check. But in any case, he's saying, you know, you take a skilled accountant who definitely knows how to add and subtract, um, um, give them a column full of numbers, have them add, subtract, add, subtract, get an answer. Do you trust that? No, you have like a built-in, like, I don't know exactly, I don't quite understand exactly how double entry accounting works or whatever, but you have like a built-in check to make sure that they've done it right. Why would you do that? Isn't every step absolutely certain? Now, I mean, right, because when you're adding a whole big column of numbers, um, if you use the algorithm that we all learned for addition, at every stage you're only adding one-digit numbers to each other. You know, so you say like 127 plus 434, well, you know, 7 plus 4 is 11. Write down the 1, carry the 1, etc. Right? You're always adding one-digit numbers to each other. Um, isn't every one of those pieces of addition pretty much just as easy as this? So isn't every one of those individual steps absolutely certain? And if every one of those steps is absolutely certain, then of course all of them put together still has to be absolutely certain. Right? Like if there's no room for doubting this, then no matter how many times you do it, you're, you know, you're multiplying some huge number of times by zero. Zero is the chance that you got it wrong at each step. So zero is the chance that you got it wrong in the end. But we don't act that way. Rather, we act like the longer the column that you have to add up, the greater the chance is that the final result is wrong. And that must mean 
again, that we think it's reasonable, even in a simple thing like this where I'm adding two one-digit numbers, we think it's reasonable not to be completely sure you did it right. So rather than the chance of it being wrong is zero, the chance of it being wrong is, you know, 0 0.001. And so if you do it thousands of times, you probably will make a mistake somewhere. Okay, so um, so so far, like I said, this is a step-by-step -step uh, process. As far as the argument has gone so far, all it's done is show that we can never be absolutely, absolutely certain of anything, even if it's based on relation of ideas. There's always some little doubt. And again, we, ought, we get the doubt not by finding any possible mistake in when we focus on the subject matter, but in the, in the reflective judgment where we think back about ourselves and our power to do things right, we find a slight reason for doubting that we've done this correctly. And so we reduce our belief in this from certainty to very high probability. But, I mean, that, of course, completely changes the nature of it. Right? We've gotten rid of all of what Locke calls knowledge, basically. Knowledge requires absolute certainty. We're saying we never have that. But on the other hand, this is not um, a general skepticism. That is, it's not showing you that you should suspend judgment about everything. It's just saying you shouldn't be completely sure. So you should take proper precautions, you know. And as, as Hume says, that's in fact what we do. Right? So when it's something like this, we act like it's, very, very likely to be right, but we take into account a slight chance that it's wrong. So we don't suspend judgment and say, I don't know whether 2 plus 2 is 4 and equals 4 or not. We say 2 plus 2 equals 4. I'm almost 100% sure. <laughs> and then we act as if 2 plus 2 equals 4, except may we take a little bit of a precaution. Okay, check your figures again this way, right? So, um, so the more the the stronger skeptical conclusion doesn't come just from just from this, and that's going to be important when Hume explains why, in fact, in the end, we don't believe the stronger skeptical conclusion. But so, how do we get the stronger skeptical solution um, conclusion? Well, we say, you know. Okay, how sure are you about this? Right, so the, what the judgment reached here is, I carried out one correctly, and like, almost certain. And again, that was based on my experience of my past attempts to do simple problems like that. I'm all, I almost certainly did that correctly. But okay, what about this judgment? How certain are you about this judgment? Well, this judgment is based on experience and, um, you know, again, using reason in this broader sense in the sense in which Locke says reason has a role to play in probabilistic reasoning as well as in demonstrative reasoning. Um, you know, there's rules for correctly judging the probability based on experience. Do I always follow those rules exactly? No. 
right? Especially when I'm thinking about the chances that I myself have done something wrong. Of course, you know, we know we all have certain biases about ourselves, and we tend to be overconfident or sometimes underconfident, depending on the situation. So when you make a further reflective judgment and think about how accurately you can make judgments like this, you say, well, um, you know, uh, not that, not a hundred percent accurate in general. I'm pretty sure about this one. It's based on a lot of experience. Um, but am I a hundred percent sure? So notice now it's getting confusing and that's going to be important. It's getting confusing because it's complicated what I'm even thinking about now. The question is how certain am I that I'm almost certain that this is right, <laughs> or that I should be almost certain that that is right. Raise this, how certain am I that it's very probable that this is right? And the answer is pretty certain, but not completely certain. Right, so the judgment here is like, I carried out two correctly, and again, this is, you know, almost certain. Almost certainly, but I'm not 100% certain that I did two correctly. Maybe I'm being overconfident, or maybe I'm being underconfident. Um, but anyway, I'm not sure I did this right. Now, um, this is a, the important step, which is also a little bit unclear. Um, but Hume says that this new judgment always, in the end, reduces my certainty about the original judgment. Right? So when I made the original judgment, I was completely certain. If you had asked me at that point, what's the probability that 2 plus 2 equals 4, I would have said the probability is 1. So, right, this was the, the first judgment. The second judgment, we understand why after the second judgment, if you had asked me what's the probability that 2 plus 2 equals 4, I would have said, you know, 0.999 or whatever. So almost 1, but not quite. Oh, I see these numbers are off the bottom of the screen. Oops. Right, so this was judgment one, and this is judgment two. The probability has gone down a little bit. And Hume says the result of judgment three is that the probability will go down more. So after this, if you ask me, what's the probability that two plus two equals four? I'm going to say instead of 0.9999, I'm going to say 0.999. So why is that? Because after all, like I said, since I'm not sure I did this right, maybe I underestimated and I really should have been more certain than I was. But I think um, the point is that, that this judgment, you know, like how certain can I be that this is right? Well, I have to worry about the worst case scenario, so to speak. Right, so like at first I thought that for sure um, there's a 0.9999 ch um, chance that I'm right about this. Now I think, well, it's actually a range around that. Let me, let me, let's have less nine so I can keep track of this, even though maybe it's not realistic. Maybe I say, after this one, I said there's a 99% chance that I'm right. After the next one, maybe I say, well, maybe it's really somewhere between 90. But when you ask me, okay, how certain are you about this now? 
I'm going to have to say this. Oops. Right? Because as far as I know, it's not better than that. Did I just... What just happened there? I was going to say, I wasn't sure if it was just me, but the... Um, yeah. The, the signal one. That's okay. Yeah, hold on. Okay, now it's back. Oh, but I see that those were off the top of the board. Obviously, I haven't positioned the camera right today. It's a little bit better. Okay. Right? So even though after this one, I think it could be that I should be this certain about it, I know that it also could be that I should only be that certain about it. So how certain am I about it? Well, only this, right? I mean, because that's the um, most I can say for sure at this point, basically. So I think that's what Hume is thinking here. So if you give him that, then it's clear how this is going to go on, right? Because now I'm going to say, well, okay, but what about this kind of judgment about how well I do this kind of judgment? How good am I doing those? And the answer is going to be, well, I mean, first of all, it seems like as this goes on, I'm going to get less and less sure how good I am at them because I don't usually make these kind of judgments very much. Um, but, uh, but assuming that that always works against me and not in my favor, um, these, each one of these later judgments is going to reduce the probability a little bit more. And Hume says, therefore, after some finite number of these judgments, the probability will go to zero. Now, um, and I guess I should say one more thing. If it's reasonable to do this, and we just showed that we do think it's reasonable to do that, right? Because, again, otherwise we wouldn't, need to check our work whenever we did mathematics problems. So if it's reasonable to do this, then it's also reasonable to do this, right? I mean, this judgment actually is less certain than this one to begin with. So it, it makes perfect sense that we should check our work on that one too. And at every stage, it's going to be the same thing, right? It's always going to make sense. It's always going to seem like it would be reasonable not to be 100% sure about what I did at the previous step, but to raise a further reflective judgment about it. Um, oh, I didn't notice that April said something a couple of minutes ago. Is it somewhat fair to say that Hume might have agreed with the limit as n, the number of judgment calls made about a demonstrative judgment tends to infinity is zero? Right, so that's what I was about to address. So Hume, so if that were the case, then since we, even if we quote unquote should carry out an infinite number of judgments, of course we can't. So um, this, that is not just, we're not good enough to, but the way um, at least the way Hume and all these people think about infinity is that an infinite series is one that doesn't come to an end. So, so it doesn't make sense to say we actually carried out an infinite number of judgments. If you actually finished them, they weren't infinite. <laughs> right. So, um, so, so what Hume wants to claim is something stronger. He wants to claim that after a finite number of judgments, it will go to zero. And he says, he backs that up by saying, this is uh, book one, part four, section one,
paragraph 6 on page 122. No finite object can subsist under a decrease repeated in infinitum. And even the vastest quantity which can enter into human imagination must in this manner be reduced to nothing. Right, so that's a principle that says that um, um, you can't just keep getting smaller and smaller forever. What, no matter how big a number you start with, and no matter how slowly you reduce it, at some point you'll get to zero. Why would you believe that? Well, of course, I mean, we know that Hume believes that about... Oh, wait, there's a question. If we already know the probability will diminish, is there any reason to go beyond step two? Oh, I think I see what you're asking. You mean, do we actually have to carry out the judgments? Can we just anticipate what effect they'll have? Is that what you mean? Hmm. That's actually a really good question. I mean, because obviously Hume thinks, in some sense, Hume thinks the answer is no, right? That is, once he's described this series, he thinks he's told you why you really, following the principles of what we usually call being reasonable, should reduce your belief in everything to zero. Um, and he did go a little bit beyond step two, just so you could get the idea of it, but not very far. Obviously, he didn't list all infinitely many judgments. Um, however, it was, it was part of his argument Right, so like the reason, you, as you said, the reason you don't have to is because you know that the probability will diminish at every stage. So, like, it's important that there really could be all these stages <laughs> and where they'll actually end up, where the argument won't work. Right, or, or what you're anticipating isn't correct. So, um, if you could show that at one of these stages, if you could show either that at one of these stages the probability would stop going down, or you wouldn't, there wouldn't be a reason to go on to the next stage, or if you could show that at every one of these stages the probability would still be positive, then, uh, um, The thing that you were supposed to allow you to step to stop at step two would turn out not to be correct. Does that? I know other people can't see the question because it's a direct message, but um, but again, the question was like, do we actually need all these other judgments once we see that the probability is going to go down at every step? Don't we already know that the probability of this should be we should assign zero as a probability of this? And the answer is yes, we already know, we, we do know that right away, but only if the series can actually be carried out. Um, okay, I don't know if that was helpful, if I answered the right question. So, right, so, I mean, we know that if this were, ex if, if this, 
like, okay, put it this way. We know that on this graph, Hume definitely thinks that you can't draw a line that keeps getting closer and closer to this line forever and never crosses it. Well, do we even know that for sure, based on what I was saying about the vacuum last time? I mean, certainly, if you look at it this way, if you think, if instead of having a line, you have like a bar plot here, Hume will say that these bars can't keep getting smaller and smaller forever without going to zero. Why? Because, remember, there are indivisible parts of extension. So there's a smallest possible, there's a shortest possible bar that you can get, and after that it will be zero. Now, I mean, we're talking about probability. It's not, I mean, we're representing it in this graph, but it's not literally the length of something. Um, but, um, so the fact that, that Hume is invoking this principle here makes it seem like he thinks it applies beyond simply the case of extension. It applies to any quantity. Um, and, um, um, I think I sort of understand why Hume would, th would think that, but he, but he has not actually made an argument for that, right? His argument was pretty specific to the case of extension, I think, because it had to do with the smallest point we could imagine. But it's not clear that there's, in the same way, that there's a smallest amount we can believe something. Um, because believing something a certain amount doesn't involve believing it all the less amounts at the same time. So his argument that our ideas, you know, must have indivisible parts or else they would be infinitely complex doesn't, uh, doesn't apply to something like probability in an obvious way. He needs a further argument, which he doesn't give. But anyway, he does seem to be... Um, relying on that principle, and if you give him that principle, then um, the conclusion seems uh, inescapable. No matter how certain, even absolutely certain, we are about the original judgment, after some finite number of reflective judgments, our certainty would go to zero. And therefore, Yes, since we know that that's what's going to happen, we don't have to wait to make all those judgments. We should just set it to zero now. Um... So what's Hume's solution to this? Why don't we just, um, why don't we just reduce the pro our belief in everything to zero? That is, why don't we just suspend belief about everything the way the ancient skeptics would advise you to do? Um, and, you know, I guess what, in, when Hume's view makes him a moderate skeptic, is that he's willing to make this argument, but then he says, rather than saying, and therefore you should believe the conclusion, he says, but you won't believe the conclusion. Um, you won't believe the conclusion. So, um, you know, so one answer is, well, because in the end, it's not really reason that determines what we believe, it's the imagination. So that's a, a first part of his answer, but for the reason, and this is where the context where that objection I raised before comes in, um, th that, that answer is not really satisfactory, right? So, you know, but as, so Hume says, first says this shows that it's not reason that determines what we believe because if reason could determine what we believe it would reduce our belief in everything to zero but the objector can come back and say well look Hume um, 
call it reason or call it imagination, you're talking about the principles by which we believe things. These are the ways we actually come to believe things or not. Right? Like the mathematician or the accountant actually comes to believe that they have the right answer by going through this process. So maybe that's imagination and not reason. Fine. But that's how we come to believe things. If that's how we come to believe things, then why don't we go through this process? Because again, it seems like Whatever the principle is, it's the same at this stage as it is at this stage, and so on and so forth. The principle is, no matter what judgment you make, you could make a second judgment to correct your first judgment. And Hume's answer is that... Um, Although it's the same principle working at every step, it doesn't work with equal force at every step. It doesn't work at for with equal force at every step because the principle, so I mean, if this, were, if this were an operation of reason, strictly speaking, this would be impossible. Necessary relations of ideas um, if the same principle gives you, you know, a demonstration at one step, it has to give you a demonstration at the next step. And every demonstration is 100% certain. So they're all just, excuse me, as forceful as each other. But in this case, Hume says, no, what's happening here is a certain uh, custom we have of trusting ourselves Right? That's what reasoning about cause and effect or probability really amounts to. We're in the habit of trusting ourselves when we do these things, but not that much. Well, so in the case here, we have a lot of experience about thinking of things like this, and they're important to us, and they're easy for us to understand. Right? We know exactly what we're thinking about here. And so that habit we have operates very powerfully. Right? We have a very strong tendency to believe that we did it right, but not completely. But then when you get to this one, as I said before, this isn't a kind of judgment I make quite as much as the other one. I don't have quite as much experience of that kind of judgment. And also, it's a little bit more complicated and confusing. So it's a little harder to think about. So the custom I have of trusting myself or not trusting myself to make these judgments is a little bit less forceful or vivid. That is, it tends a little bit less to affect my belief than the, than the first stage one did. And then when I get to this one, and I'm trying to go now to the fourth stage. This is really kind of, number one, a judgment I don't make that often at all about my ability to make judgments, about my ability to make judgments. And it's complicated. It's getting to the point where to keep track of like exactly what it is I'm thinking about there. I'm going to have to put in parentheses and quotation marks and all kinds of stuff to keep it clear. Um, so, the, so I have much, again, less vivid, forceful um, habit as far as treating these judgments as certain or uncertain or whatever than I had to begin with. So each one of these stages, um, although they're all operating on the same principle, each one of them affects my belief less than the one before. And what you have to add here, but I think Hume thinks this is true, is that the effect goes to zero much faster than the original probability would go to zero. 
right? So if, let's say this is what would happen if each of them had equally strong effects, you would do this. But now what I'm saying is this one has this much effect, but this one only has this much effect. You can't see this very well, but anyway. Um, and this one has practically no effect. And long before these bars go down to zero, the difference between one bar and, this, and the next becomes zero. And so my probability, my probability becomes stable at some positive value. Some positive, and at least if the first judgment is like this, pretty high value. And so I get, I mean, like I said, you, you have to add that in because if the force of this principle um, only went down very, very slowly, you might think this probability would reach zero before that saved you. But it's really the other way around. And, uh, and I mean, Hume says, I, I think that's what Hume thinks. In fact, Hume thinks that almost all the, that basically all the steps after the second step don't have much effect, right? Unless it's a really important case or something. Maybe I'll go to the third step and I barely ever go beyond that. And if I do, I'm straining to understand the complicated nature of the very unaccustomed judgment I'm making. And whatever I conclude has virtually no effect on my belief. So you might think, well, what's the point of going through all this then? Um, there is this skeptical argument. There's nothing wrong with it as an argument. That is, I guess, I don't know how to put this exactly, but if we were beings that were perfectly susceptible to, to, the, to, to the same principles about probability, no matter what the subject matter was, the argument would convince us. There's no flaw in the steps of the argument. Um, but um, nevertheless, it's impossible for us to believe the conclusion. Um, the argument won't work, and moreover, no other argument will work. Um, Hume says we can, you know, we can't help believing any more than we can help breathing. Um, no matter what argument you read, that's that is where the conclusion is that you shouldn't believe anything. It it won't work. So why go to all this trouble of setting out this argument then? And so it seems like, although we can't believe the conclusion of the argument, there's something we can believe that the conclusion and the solution to the argument or the explanation why we don't believe the argument shows. Um, and this is... Um, Book one, section four, part, part four, section one, paragraph eight on page 123. Um. I can't find the I'll just read this part at the end. It's just as good as the quote I was looking for. Um
All right. But as experience will sufficiently convince anyone who thinks it worthwhile to try that though he can find no error in the foregoing arguments, yet he still continues to believe and think and reason as usual, he may safely conclude that his reasoning and belief is some sensation or peculiar manner of conception which tis impossible for mere ideas and reflections to destroy. Right, so the conclusion of the conclusion we're supposed to draw from this is not the radical skeptical conclusion that you shouldn't believe anything, but is the moderate skeptical conclusion that belief is something that's not um, or not completely subject to reason. That it's um, ultimately a matter of the sensitive part of our nature, as Hume puts it. Um, so again, that belief is something that we're in a sense not accountable for because uh, we can't help having belief. So apparently that conclusion Hume thinks we can believe, right? That is once we leave the philosophy room and stop concentrating on the skeptical argument, we won't be able to doubt for a second that, that 2 plus 2 equals 4 or any of our other usual beliefs. But we can remember that, we can come out remembering that belief is ultimately out of our control, that nature forces us, quote unquote, to have certain beliefs and um, we can't uh, reason our way out of them. Um, so is it obvious that we can believe that conclusion? Hume thinks we can, obviously, and he thinks it's important for whatever reason that we do that. But I think um, um, part of Kant's strategy in um, coming back against Hume is to deny that we can coherently believe that about our own beliefs at least certainly that we could believe that about our own beliefs as part of the conclusion of some argument. Okay, that's all I want to say about skepticism with regard to reason. Are there questions about that before I go on to skepticism with regard to the senses? Okay. So in this part also, that is section two, um, Hume also begins by claiming that we're not going to believe the results. Right? So he says, you know, no matter how closely you follow my arguments, um, that we should suspend knowledge, we should suspend judgment about our alleged sensitive knowledge. Um, as you know, an hour after I finish making the argument, you're going to find yourself believing in bodies again, just like you always did. Um, however, by the time we get to the end, and even just to the end of section two, but I think then it becomes stronger as we get to the end of the entire part four, that, um, it starts to seem a little bit different than the first part. And I think the difference is because um, because this argument works a little bit differently than the first one. The first, the argument about in section one, skepticism with regard to reason, works by trying to reduce our belief, that is, the degree of probability that we attach to any given um, conclusion. 
but it doesn't find anything wrong with the conclusion. Right throughout all those judgments, nothing ever told against the conclusion that 2 plus 2 equals 4. We just left that alone and started thinking about our own powers. Whereas the argument in section 2 um, actually tries to show that there's something incoherent about our ordinary beliefs about bodies. So it's not just that maybe we shouldn't be so sure about them, and then maybe we shouldn't even be that sure, and then maybe we shouldn't be sure at all, but it's that from a certain point of view, we can be sure they're wrong because they contradict each other. So the path toward going back to believing them as always is a little bit weird in this case because we're going back to, to believing something that we just showed couldn't really be believed because it contradicts itself. <laughs> um, okay, so anyway, I mean, we'll see more about why... Um, how that works and what Hume's reaction to it is, especially in part seven, in uh, section seven of part four. But for now, I'm just gonna explain how the argument in part two works. And um, so before getting to the details of the argument, um, it's important to clarify what skepticism with regard to the senses means here. So what it means is, um, again, it's about what Locke calls sensitive knowledge. So sensitive knowledge is the knowledge that the objects of, and it's going to be the objects of external sense, right? That is the objects of the senses, as we usually understand them, that the objects of the senses exist. So, right, we're going to, you know, and, um, so that's what the question is, but then right away it splits into two parts because Hume says there's two different beliefs, general beliefs, about what the objects of the senses are. So the first view is the view of the vulgar. And right, vulgar here just means common. I don't remember if I've talked about that word before in this course or not, but um, right, it doesn't mean like having bad manners or something like that. It just means common. It can be derogatory, but only because common can be derogatory, right? Like, oh, that's so common, <laughs> right? So anyway, so the belief of the vulgar, that is of ordinary people, and Hume says, by the way, this means all of us some of the time. And I think really when he speaks more carefully, he says this means all of us most of the time. This is what we all usually believe. Who doesn't believe it? Philosophers, when they're thinking carefully about this subject. But philosophers the rest of the time and everyone else always believes this according to him. And what they believe is, it's basically what Barclay says the view of common sense is that, you know, um, here's the mind, and here's the objects like pens and tables and trees and etc. And these things are the immediate objects of the mind and perception. So what I see is the pen. You might say, well, what? wait, of course what I see is the pen. What's the alternative? 
Well, the alternative is the philosophical view. That the mind has certain immediate objects in perception. Uh, I'm not, I haven't loved myself enough when I'm here. This is the vulgar view. Here's the mind. It has these immediate objects, pens, trees, that's a pen, tables. Here's the philosopher's view. The mind has immediate objects. The immediate objects are ideas. And the ideas represent some things that are outside the mind. So I guess yeah, I should say the immediate objects of the mind are inside the mind. They're ideas, but they represent things that are outside the mind, such as trees, pens, and tables. Right, so we know that that's Locke's view. There's an immediate object that's an idea, and then there's an immediate object that is a body. Whereas the vulgar view is that what we see immediately and feel and otherwise sense um, are bodies, not ideas that represent bodies. So like I said, the vulgar view is close to, that is what Hume is describing as common sense, is close to what Barclay thinks is common sense. But there's an important difference um, that the vulgar believe that these immediate objects of perception also exist when we're not perceiving them. Right, so like I'm holding this pen in front of my face. What I'm seeing is the pen, not the idea of a pen, the pen itself. Um, so it's what Barclay would call an idea. It's the immediate object of perception. But Barclay thinks that that immediate object of perception is in the mind and depends on the mind. So I close my eyes. I don't see a pen anymore. Barclay says the idea is gone. The pen is gone. The pen was the idea. Whereas, and according to Barclay, that's common sense. But Hume says, no, common sense is that the idea or impression, as he would call it, is the pen. When I close my eyes, the pen doesn't go away. Therefore, the impression doesn't go away. So what the vulgar believe is that um, what Locke or Barclay would call an idea, the immediate object of the mind and perception, has an existence outside of the mind and continues to exist even when it's not perceived. Whereas the philosophers describing the same thing say, um, when I was holding my pen, the pen in front of my face, the pen, that is the body, was causing me to perceive a certain idea. And that's what I perceived immediately, the visible pen idea. I close my eyes, now the visible pen idea is gone, but the body is still there, the pen itself. Now I open my eyes, the idea comes back. Right, so in other words, according to the vulgar, let's just do this just with the pen. This direction is time, and here's where I close my eyes. Right? So according to the vulgar, what happened was that I saw this directly, immediately, not by way of a representative. I closed my eyes. This thing continued to exist. I opened my eyes. I again perceive it directly. 
Whereas according to the philosophers, what happened was, I perceived this directly, the pen idea. I was caused to perceive it by this body, the pen. Close my eyes. The pen still exists. The pen isn't dependent on my mind for the existence, it's a body. But the idea is, so I close my eyes, there's no more pen idea. Open my eyes, now the pen can cause me to perceive it again, and so the idea comes back. Only, of course, it's not the same as this idea. Right? It's another idea that's exactly similar to this one. In between, there was no pen idea. Okay, now I think uh, I'm going to have to hurry because I'm seeing it's already 6.45. Um, but, right, so skepticism with respect to the senses is going to mean different things to the vulgar or to the philosophers. In both cases, what, we're, what Hume is going to call into question is the continued and distinct existence of bodies, the objects of external sense. But for the vulgar, what that means is he's going to question whether this impression continues to exist even when it's not in my mind. Whereas the philosophers already agree that the idea doesn't exist when it's not in my mind. He's going to be questioning whether there's something else the body that continues to exist, even though the idea isn't there. And, um, and the reason I'm going into this at such great length is that the argument in Part 4, Section 2 is almost all directed against this. Right? That is, the way it works is he... he he tries to explain why the vulgar, that is, all of us most of the time, believe this. Namely, that the very thing that we see immediately, the impression, still exists even when we don't see it. What makes us believe that? He explains what makes us believe that. Shows that it's due to principles of the imagination, um, not to principles of reason, but moreover, it's not even the same principles of imagination that work in reasoning from cause and effect. It actually, it's kind of like based on an overgeneralization or like um, going beyond what habit should cause us to believe. We, we continue to associate um, our memory of this uh, impression with the pre impression exact actually existing or something like that. I'm not sure exactly how to describe this, but we continue to have that belief even though um, it goes beyond the regularities that we've actually experienced. So basically it's a kind of what Locke would call madness. It goes beyond the justifications such as they are for probabilistic reasoning, according to Hume. So it goes beyond reason, even in the broader sense that he used it in part two. Okay, so the question, in the vulgar view, is the pen the same pen after you open your eyes, or is it a new pen? No, it's the same pen. Well, yes, it's the same pen. I mean... According to both of them, it's the same pen, right? That is, they both believe in the continued existence of bodies. That is, bodies exist even when we're not perceiving them. And they both believe in the distinct existence of bodies. That is, bodies don't depend on, their, on our mind for their existence. They just disagree about what bodies are, <laughs> right? So, I mean, so, like, the the vulgar identify the body with the impression that I perceive directly at this time. And so they say that's what continues to exist this whole time. And when I open my eyes again, I have that very same impression back. Whereas the philosophers say, 
I had an idea. I didn't have that idea. Now I have a new idea. But this thing that's not an idea, that I only perceive immediately, this continued to exist the whole time. Okay. I see that I really don't have time to do the rest of this argument justice, but I'll do the best I can today and maybe finish it next time. Um, Um, so, right, so like I said, um, Hume spends most of his time in this section concentrating on this view, and he spends most of his time showing that it's, that we formed it by a kind of um, natural and inevitable process of the imagination, but one that wasn't reasonable, not even in the broader sense of reasonable. Um, but then towards the end, he also goes on, is this really at the end? I don't know. Then he, he, he also, so I mean, so far, what would that mean? It would mean that, um, okay, there's like another thing that we can't help believing, just like we can't help believing in cause and effect. So we know it's not strictly speaking rational, not even in the broader sense, but there's other principles that, you know, nature has taken care that we believe this. And so, you know, we're gonna believe it and that's the end of the story. But that's why, uh, the, the, the twist comes when he argues that not only is this view unreasonable, but it's certainly false. Or at least that our usual rules of reasoning about cause and effect should lead us to conclude that it's false. Right, I mean, not that it, so not that, and I guess this is important. Barclay would say that this view involves a contradiction, right? Because Barclay says that, that to, we can't conceive of an idea that is the direct object of perception existing except in a mind. And so to believe that this idea could continue to exist when it's not in my mind anymore and then come, bit, come back into my mind when I open my eyes, according to Barclay, involves a contradiction. But Hume actually argues that it doesn't involve a contradiction. So it's not certainly false in that sense, but he's going to say that it does contradict the usual principles of cause and effect, and therefore, when we think carefully, we can't really believe it. And I guess... Um, since I'm almost out of time and I'm not going to have time to go into the details of like why we do believe it, I'll just say why he says we can't really believe it if we think carefully. And he gives the example of suppose you press one of your eyeballs with your finger. So now all of a sudden you see twice as many things as you did before. So, um, according to this view, that would have to mean that there are twice as many things as there were before. Right? I mean, I saw one pen, that was the pen. It wasn't an idea that represents the pen, it was the pen. Now, I press my eyeball, now there are two of them. Which one is the pen? <laughs> so, um, so basically the, the, the way this contradicts our usual reasoning from cause and effect, I think is this, that um, I'm not gonna be able to claim that both of these pens 
both of those two pens have a continued and distinct existence. One of them is was only there when I pressed my eyeballs, so it's not independent of me. Um, and it doesn't continue when I'm not perceiving it. Like, for example, if I just stop my pressing my eyeball, it doesn't continue. It goes away. But the problem is that um, the two pens are the same as each other. Right? They look exactly the same. So, um, so what we would be reduced to saying here is that the same effect has two different causes. We don't know which one, but one of them is there because it has a distinct and independent existence, and the other one is simply representing it or something like that. And that violates the principle that from the same effects you should infer the same cause. Um, so, I mean, that's a complicated way of putting it, but I think uh, you have to put it fair, in a fairly complicated way to, to, to see why he thinks that, we, we, that that type of example really rules out this view. So... The conclusion then is that although what the vulgar think is not self-contradictory, we can't really believe it when we think carefully. And who thinks carefully? Philosophers. Always? No, most of the time they don't, and then they believe the same thing as the vulgar do. But every once in a while, when philosophers turn their attention to this question, they think carefully, they remember examples like that, and then what do they do? And Hume says basically what they should do, in some sense of should, in some sense of like what would be perfectly rational to do or something like that, what they should do is go to Barclay's view and say, no, there's nothing that has continued in distinct existence here. There's this pen and there's another pen. But what they instead do is this. They say, Oh, I see. So what I actually see isn't the pen itself. Because what I actually see is the kind of thing that can be doubled when I press my eyeball and whatever. That's just an idea. But I'm not going to give up on the pen itself. I'm just going to put it somewhere else and still believe in that. And Hume basically says that that step is even less reasonable. <laughs> so the philosophers have gotten off into an even weirder fiction. But remember, he himself accepted that fiction in section two. So he's including himself in the philosophers here. When he thinks about it carefully, he's forced from this to this, even though he knows that in some sense he shouldn't do that and he should go to Barclay's view. He can't do it. He goes to this. All right. So I'll talk about that more next time. I'll see you then. Bye.